Earlier this week, I shared my impressions on Doom Eternal after playing the game for three hours. But while on site at the event, I also had an opportunity to chat with the game's executive producer. I'm Marty Stratton. I'm the executive producer of Doom Eternal, and uh, I'm also the studio director at id. Starting with the release of Doom 2016, the focus for the id tech team has been to deliver high-end visuals at extremely high frame rates. And with Doom Eternal, we're moving to the next iteration of id tech, id tech 7. Many of the improvements are evident right from the get-go, but I was curious from the design perspective what id Tech 7 allows the development team to achieve that wasn't possible with the previous generation engine. The size of the world, the, the scope of the world, um, our levels are twice as big as they were in uh, 2016, and that was to really establish a sense of scale and epicness, uh, if that's a word, to the game. Um, you know, our uh, w one of the things that we we established coming out of 2016 was that we really wanted to take players to, to places that they'd never seen before. Um, so that, you know, Doom 2016 was pretty much just Mars and hell. Um, and, you know, in this game, we, we do hell on earth. We do uh, the Sentinel home world, something we alluded to in 2016 lore. Um, we take you to an Arctic uh, uh, cultist base um, take you to kind of our version of heaven, uh, hell, obviously. So, um, and, and with each of those, uh, basically a, a Phobos, you know, you go from Phobos to Mars, jumping from rock piece to rock piece as Mars is blowing apart. Like these, these set pieces in these worlds had to be really, really big. Um, and, uh, and that was, I would say that drove a lot of the, the technical work that, that was done. Uh, across the board, of course, you know things like uh, physics and and some some better destructibility in the world uh, that that would reinforce you know kind of your power. Our destructible demon system uh, required uh, quite a bit of technical effort from our team. Uh, updates to the animation system. Um, we, we have a we had a new um, uh, kind of a TD animator uh, Ben that started with us and really really pushed the. The, the way uh, we create rigs to character rigs that, uh, God, I mean, it just made all the difference in the world for, for how we could iterate on characters and, and what the animators could do with them. Um, so really across the, the gore system, I mean, across the board, it was, it was kind of demands on the, the tech team um, to do bigger, better, bolder. You know, I mean, it, it really was, uh, we were pushing the envelope in every as aspect of the project. Uh, which is almost always a direct request to tech, uh, you know, in, in some way. Based on my experiences with the game thus far then, this rings true. Each stage is larger and more complex than anything in Doom 2016. There's a ton of geometry packed into every scene, and it's just impressive to see this level of detail maintained while targeting 60 frames per second. Of course, at the event, we only played the game on the PC. So what about PC-specific features such as ray tracing? So we actually haven't talked about that at all. Um, and we, we quite frankly, haven't spent a ton of time. The, the team um, basically did some initial uh, implementation and, uh, and exploration about a year ago. Um, but at that same time, we had so much that we wanted to do on the game still. Um, and uh, the, I mean, like our tech team, they're, <laughs> they are the biggest fans of new tech. So it was a little hard to, to pull everybody off of that because it was the shiny new toy. Um, but, uh, uh, but when we're talking about getting the game out there um, and, and, and getting it out as close to on time as possible and, and at the highest polished quality, we kind of had to, had to pull back on that effort. So uh, it is something that, the, that they're like literally just about ready to start looking at again. Um, and they actually have some interesting ideas. I, I don't wanna go too far down that path because who knows what, what exactly we do, but there's, there's more that you can use the technology for than just um, you know, the, the reflections and the, the, um, the shadows and uh, the, the real time lighting and that kind of stuff. Um, so they have, some, they have some really cool ideas that I think uh, will not only just make it a better experience for players, but actually, uh, you know, some of some of what he's talking about it will make it a better uh, and, and easier to create experience for developers. And what about next generation consoles? Whenever we come out or whatever level of backwards compatibility, I know there's a lot of discussion around exactly how it all is going to work. 
Um, but we want to be one of the best looking, best playing games on, on that platform right away as well. To, so um, we, are, we are actively looking at it and, um, and very excited by it. And uh, it, I think in, a, in an awesome position. Obviously, at this stage, developers can't really say a whole lot about these new machines, but it really does sort of raise some questions about how games like this will be handled. There are indications that with perfect backwards compatibility, it may be possible to simply introduce new patches into the games, kind of like what happened when PS4 Pro and Xbox One X were released. Thus, conceivably, the version of Doom Eternal that you buy in March of this year for consoles could wind up having enhancements when the time comes for the new systems. Again, this is all just kind of speculation on my part, nothing that has been said officially, but it seems to make a lot of sense. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I was also curious about the Switch port being handled by Panic Button. After all, their work in bringing Doom 2016 to the Switch is extremely impressive, but I'm curious to see how a more complex game like Doom Eternal holds up. They are, I, I, I call them masters of that platform because they are just, um, where I, you know, where I think our tech team is amazing, and, and a lot of a lot of what they're able to do is because our our engine is so flexible, and and um, uh, because of uh, because of what our engine team has has been able to do. Um, but man, they they are just. So, sometimes I'll get builds and just be like, I don't know how you do this. Like it's it's really it's really pretty awesome. Um, they actually have helped us out quite a bit. They they shifted some of their resources on the switch over to to help us out on on Doom Eternal just because we we were trying to you know really trying to get as much polish and and uh, and get done as as close to on time as possible. Even though we did get a get an extension, um, but uh, the the switch version is is coming along really really well. Um, it needed a little extra time, just like uh, like the uh, the base game did. Um, but you know, we know the demand; like we hear it, so uh, it's it's top priority, um, and uh, um, and I think it's going to be great. I mean, I really I really do. They're they're fantastic, and and uh, the 2016 version was awesome, and and so many people enjoyed it and loved it, and it's it's kind of gotten such a following that it's that it's. The, honestly, it's really a little surprising. I, I, I knew it was going to be good, but um, the the passion around it, um, the passion for a mature rated shooter uh, like Doom on the Switch is uh, is is slightly surprising. I think overall, uh, so. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled by it. I mean, I think it's I think it's fantastic. So it's disappointing that the Switch version is shipping after the others, but it is interesting to note that Panic Button is assisting on the main game as well. And thinking of development, this left me curious about the tools side of things. Obviously, the quality of the tools is critical in designing any game, and crafting those tools from the ground up for an in-house engine is of course a huge undertaking. How have these tools evolved then during the creation of Doom Eternal to support creating larger, more complex worlds? There's always tools requests happening. I mean, constantly. Um, the uh, the the there's two there's two aspects of of kind of the the larger scale worlds. Um, one of which is that we really started to build larger scale worlds before the engine was great at running them fast. So um, if there's one thing that I would say our engine team is is good at has become great at um, is optimization. Um, so uh, the the kind of tools and uh, uh, techniques that they have uh, they've developed for the designers, the environment artists, to optimize the worlds that really kind of got very big is uh, it, it was a little bit of like, hey, we're going to do this, and then you know it's it's almost like the the design team and the environment artists kind of. Push it up like this, and the and the and the uh, the engine team says okay, but like okay, and then the design team goes like this, and then the engine team, you know, optimizes and and figures out how you know how we can call things that aren't seen and um, create all kinds of layers that that turn things on and off as as the game plays, so that uh, so that really <laughs> like every <laughs> it's it's it, it's crazy when you can kind of see behind it. But it's it's like almost every piece of the hardware and and all of the rendering and everything is is used just for what's in front of you. And then between streaming and calling and layers and all this kind of stuff, 
like where you move, you know, we're just pulling so much additional information in. Um, so we're, we're, we're really throwing every bit of, uh, of the hardware at what's directly in front of the player. And, um, and I think it shows, I think it shows on all the platforms. Um, so, uh, there's, there's, there's always uh, tools requests the, the environment team works particularly well with the, uh, the engine Billy and the, like our lead environment artists, uh, Lear and, and, um, uh, Billy, who's our, our engine lead, uh, they are like, you know, always working together on new techniques for the environment artists to be able to um, create, uh, you know, create the world in, in as high of fidelity as possible. And what about the shift away from mega textures, which were introduced in Rage? We really completed the departure from mega texture, um, which allowed us to do uh, more instance geometry, more instance texture, tiling textures, uh, which also allowed us to have higher fidelity textures. So for the first time, I, I would say we've really gotten away. I think the last several games, you could criticize our, our um, texture fidelity be a little blurry. Um, and uh, I think this, this game is, is the first one where we're really, we're really at the top of the heap when it comes to texture fidelity. And um, there was a constant request, stream of requests um, to allow that type of uh, um, work to be done from tiling textures and, and instance geometry, but still give the, the environment artist the ability to stamp on that, um, to blend, uh, and the, the features that, uh, that the team put together are phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really fantastic. I can't, I can't wait for, for what we do next, honestly, because it's, it's one of the best bases we've ever, we've ever even built from. I, I think because we're at the end of the console cycle and, and the engine team is so familiar with the hardware, um, we're really, you know, they're just squeezed. I say we're like, I'm, I'm, I'm part of their massive achievements, but uh, they are, uh, uh, I mean, they're really squeezing every little bit out of, the, out of the hardware. And, you know, the engine is so flexible that it can do that. It can, it can really scream on high-end PCs, you know, push outlandish frame rates, um, and then, you know, man, with the with the new consoles coming, I'm I'm really excited to see what we can do there too. So that's where we are at the moment, but there are still a lot of questions to be answered here. At the very least, it seems that id Software is in a very good place now. As I said before, Doom 2016 marked its return to form as both a game and technical powerhouse, and Eternal looks to continue this with even more confidence on the part of the studio. Id Tech 7 itself also seems like an amazing foundation for current and future generation games. I'll certainly be curious to see if Doom Eternal itself receives a new release or some sort of update when the new consoles arrive, allowing for higher resolutions, more detail and performance. Maybe we'll even see a little bit of ray tracing in the console version in the future, who knows? One other thing I didn't get to mention in the last video though is support for HDR. During our session, it was mentioned that Doom Eternal will support HDR, unlike every other id tech release thus far, which is a very good thing indeed. As Doom Eternal draws nearer to release then, we'll have a lot more to say about it when the time comes. It's a game I'm eager to play and discuss here on DF simply because I love this type of shooter more than anything else, and I love that id Software is pushing the envelope in terms of visuals and performance as well. So we'll be back closer to release with more on Doom Eternal, but that's going to do it for this little interview piece I've put together. If you did enjoy it, be sure to let us know by liking, subscribing, ringing that bell, and of course, following us over on Twitter to discuss this game or anything else, really. But until next time, this is John signing off.